Welcome. Today, if you're wondering what the heck is on the screen, we're looking at about $50,000 in generated income from a portrait photography studio here with Jen Bruno Smith. And it's yeah. happened in about 23 days. So we're going to find out exactly what led to this, how this happened, and you know, and Jen's gonna share some insights into you know what led to this immense success. So hi Jen, how are you? Hey, I'm really good. How's it going? Pretty good. So we're basically 23 days into the fall and this yeah. typically tends to be people's like really, really busy season, right? And for a lot of people, you know, $50,000 in 23 days or a month that can make up like their entire year. So before we even get into that, I want to know, like, how did you even get to this point? Like, how did you even get into portrait photography of women? You know, how did you get into boudoir? It's a great question. Um, so I've been shooting for about nine years. I used to shoot family, maternity, newborn for maybe about five or six. And then uh, I had a client that was like, hey, can you take some sexy pictures of me for my boyfriend? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I started and I was really good at it. And then it just kept going and I kept getting hired. And then I started figuring out the secrets to running my business effectively. And it just took off. And, um, and now here we are. Sometimes I'm still a little in shock a bit when I pull these metrics up and I'm like, wow, it's another $50,000 a month. Wow, I'm trending towards $60,000 this month. It's insane. Okay. So obviously, like, you didn't start like this. Like, how, how did you even get to this point? Like, what were the stepping stones? Like, how long ago did you start? Yeah. So I started shooting in 2000 and gosh, nine, I guess, 2009. And I worked a full-time job concurrently. I was a speech pathologist. So I worked in the schools, I worked in medical settings. And then I got a job where I was working as a clinical liaison, as basically a marketer. And I used to market to physicians. But what that allowed me to do was have a lot more freedom. So I was basically making my own schedule and I was working from home and kind of going out and marketing to hospitals when I wanted to. And that allowed me to start shooting more. And what I found was the more I started shooting, the more I was getting hired. And then it just got to the point where I was losing money by working my day job. And so I quit and here I am. Okay. So that's a pretty long journey, but like, <laughs> like how did it start? Like, you know, a lot of people are, all, I always hear this too, right? Like uh, people credit like people's success to like where they live, you know, maybe they had like some artistic side, like do you consider yourself just natural born? Like when you started, was it all like, super successful or like where did you even start like as far as like the business yeah so I feel like my my education my background so I have a, a bachelor's degree in business and marketing and then I worked as a clinical liaison so I really dug into the marketing side and I feel like once I started working those jobs and getting that education I started realizing and understanding what I needed to do to apply it to my photography business and once I started doing those things, it, it really started taking off. And for me, I think the key was building my email automations. I really feel like that was the start of when my business started to become really successful. Um, having those multiple touch points with my clients was so important. Okay. So you, you start getting those emails and like people start getting contacted multiple times. How, how did you even start getting people on your email list? Yeah, that's a great question. So I actually didn't start running Facebook ads until July of this year. So last year, my business grossed uh, over a half a million dollars without any Facebook ads, without Google AdWords, right? So what I started doing to build my business was going to bridal shows. And I used to do like eight to 10 shows a year. I was like hitting the pavement hard and I would build my email, email list through bridal shows. And the great thing about bridal shows, I don't think they get enough credit. I think that a lot of people write them off, especially boudoir photographers, but it's very powerful because, you know, when you think about booking people, most of the time, it, you know, it's much easier to book warm leads. And what you're doing at a bridal show is turning people into warm leads quickly because they're getting to know you, they're seeing your work, they're having that one-on-one -on -one interaction. And it's so much more personal than whenever you see someone coming into your inbox and you don't really know them. So that's the first really amazing thing about bridal shows. And then the second is 
you're catching people at the beginning of their life cycle. So think about when people book boudoir photographers or really any photographer in general. It's in major life events, right? When you're getting married, uh, before your first child, after your second child, when you've lost 20 pounds, when you're getting a divorce, right? So people will book you at major changes in their life cycle. And whenever you start getting to know them in the very start of their life cycle, their adult life, they'll keep following you, especially if you stay in their inbox. And I just talked about this the other night. I had a really great experience. Last week I did a shoot for a woman and I always ask her when, like how they found me because my, my studio manager, Nikki books a lot of my shoots now. So I really don't have a lot of interaction with them before, but she's like, you're not going to believe this. But seven years ago, we were at a Christmas tree farm and you took a picture of my daughter who was six months at the time. And then we got on your email list and we've been following you ever since. And so my sales average is $4,000 and I booked her because seven years ago I was actually pregnant with Jackson and we were in this Christmas tree farm doing our gender reveal pictures. And I remember them. I saw them and her daughter had these beautiful blue eyes and you know, the light was perfect and there was green behind her. And I was like, Oh my God. Your daughter's gorgeous. I'm so inspired by her face. I just want to take her picture. I'll email you the picture. I don't want any money. And they kept my information. I stayed in their inbox and then she's hired me, right? And that's a $4,000 sale easy, if not more. That's really cool because, you know, that, that seems like you just love photography so much and you're like obsessed with it and you see pretty things and you like take photographs of them. And a lot of times like, everyone always thinks like, you know, what kind of marketing ploy, what kind of this or that. And it's like, you know, if you provide value to people and you connect with as many people as possible and you're just nice and you provide value back to marketplace, like people remember you and they'll tell their friends about you and then they'll come back and like have raving reviews. And I feel like you're getting, you're at that point because you started from that, right? That's it. And I think that's the key that people miss is you have to remember that people buy from people they know, they like, and they trust. So your client base needs to know you, they need to like you, and they need to trust you. And if you're missing any of those things, it's difficult to get booked. Yeah. And I always make the analogy that like, you know, who's the realtor you use to buy your house, right? It was the one you knew, right? It might not be the best realtor in Delaware. You don't know who that is. No one knows who that is, but like, as long as you know them and you like like them, to you, in your world, they become the best realtor, right? Because you use them and why would you not use somebody who's actually really good? Yeah, that's right. So you mentioned your average being at that point. So obviously like, you know, seven, eight years ago, like that wasn't your average. So yeah. how, did, how did that escalate, right? Like how did you go from like taking people's pictures for yeah. free and sending them you know, at a pumpkin patch place. Yeah. And like where you are now, like what was yeah. the transition? Was it just overnight or? No, it wasn't overnight. It's been a lot of growth and a lot of, you know, so I come from a scientific background, right? And so I understand the scientific process and analyzing things and figuring out what works and what doesn't and changing variables. And so getting to this point has been a lot of that. And I'm always analyzing my process and tweaking things and looking at my shooting workflow and seeing which poses are selling and which aren't and how I can change and what I can do to be better and to do better. And, you know, even from last year to this year, I think last year my sales average was like, gosh, I don't know, 3,100. I forget it offhand. I can tell you exactly, but I think it was like 3,200. This year it's 4,000. So even just in a year time, and last year I was like, there's no way I'm going to, you know, $3,000 is a great sales average. Like there's no way I'm getting higher than that. And then this year, like it's, it's, it's solidly 4,000. It, it's crazy. But if you keep working and, you know, changing your, um, figuring out what works, you just keep getting better. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point, right? Because a lot of times I'll see people, they, you know, they'll try to cherry pick pricing from a bunch of different people, put it yes. together and they yes. follow one sort of process. So yes. like the Frankenstein of stuff and they're just, yes. I was just talking about that today. Alberto. We wouldn't even talk about that. I literally just talked about that on the phone this morning. You're right. Absolutely. So they put together this Frankenstein and then when they don't have that mindset of like, Hey, how do I improve all this? Like they just try it once and they say, well, this doesn't work. And then yeah. They'll go into a Facebook group and they'll validate it and say, who else has a problem with IPS? And then, you know, the people that 
also believe that they'll, they'll validate their opinion and they'll say, yeah, you're right. It doesn't work. And then yeah. they just leave and they say, well, three people on Facebook work. group said it didn't work and it didn't work right. one time for me. And then they give up. Like, yeah. how do you get past that? It's such a good point. I, I love that you just said that. I was literally just talking about that this morning because I talked to so many photographers and, you know, listen, there's more than one way to do things. Right. And, and our way isn't the only way that works, right? There's other ways that work too. But what I find is that photographers will pull bits and pieces from what I do and then bits and pieces from someone else and then someone else and someone else. And then they try and build this Frankenstein of a business model. And then they're like, why isn't this working? I'm not, I'm not finding success. And it's like, you're using things that don't work together. It's this, the sum is greater than the parts. And so what you need to do is find something that works, a model that works, and then you lean into it and you do it and you, you know, open up to the change instead of doing it. I know you're trying to do it the cheap way and just pull like inexpensive things from each, but that doesn't always work. It's better to just make the investment and do something that works and then do it the whole way instead of pulling these bits and pieces out from a million different models. Yeah. Okay, so you're going to these bridal shows, you know, what was that even like? Like, what were you like, was your first booth successful? Like, did it look pretty? Like, what did that look like? So the first show we, I actually took, so my husband was there. I was pregnant. I was pregnant with, gosh, I forget which baby. I was definitely pregnant. I don't remember which one though. Um, and then we had Liz, my makeup artist. And then I actually had, a girl named Taylor, who was the very first girl that I did a boudoir shoot for. And um, we booked like eight people. And I was like, oh my gosh, this actually works. And my booth was not impressive. I had done maybe three shoots and those were the images that I showed. Um, I used a tablecloth and I used ribbon and I tied it to a backdrop stand. It was very simple. But yeah, once we realized that it worked and then I collected those emails and I started following up with people, I was like, oh my gosh, eight shoots like that. That was so simple. And yeah, I invested in the you know fee to have the booth, but it's paid back in spades because I will still book people from shows that I did three years ago. Like they'll book me and they'll be like, hey, I met you in Philly in 2016. And I'll be like, wow. Like they'll even keep my marketing cards. Like it's crazy. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, you know, you, you book those eight and you start getting those emails. Um, like, what do you think the hardest part was of even getting started with it? Like, because I know for me, uh, that's something I would probably never dare do because like, I just, am, I would get overwhelmed by like how much physical stuff has to be made. Yeah. And, like, I'm, I'm so like, fickle that I would, I would get something printed and then I would want to change it. And I'd be like, well, I can't do the show now. So like, what, what do you think was the hardest part? And like, you know, what, what stops most people from like doing it very successfully? Yeah. So what held me back in the beginning was I didn't know where to start. I didn't know how to do a show. I didn't know what I needed. And there aren't a lot of resources out there. Like I remember being on Pinterest and looking on Pinterest and searching Facebook groups. And there were no courses that told me as a boudoir photographer how to do a show and do it well. And so that was the biggest thing that was holding me back because I didn't have a guide. I didn't know what to do. And I was fairly new to the genre, um, fairly new to, you know, running a successful business and being booked out. So, you know, that was basically what held me back in the beginning. But now I've done so many shows, like we actually just, I just order all of the promo stuff, like a thousand or 2000 in a clip and it just stays in my garage. And now I'm at the point where I'm booked until August, well, late August of 2020, like booked solidly with three to four shoots a week. Um, but I'm still going to do two. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I'll be booked out for 2020 by the end of this year, shooting three to four a week. It's crazy. Yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy. It's job security. I love it. Like, I know I'm going to have income. I'm not worried about it. Like, I love shooting. And when I don't shoot for like four, I just took a vacation and I didn't shoot for five days and I was starting to get a little like anxious. Where, where did you get like the emails for your email content when you started? Because I, I know for a lot of people, they, they go to the shows, they'll try it. <clears throat> they'll book some people there and they might get some emails. But then 
I've almost every person I've spoken to, like if they've done the show before they've spoken to me or you, like it's not a horror story because it's better than they were before, but yeah. they'll literally be like, oh my God, like my show went pretty well. I got bookings. It paid for itself. I have all these emails. What do I do with them? What do I write these people? And I'm like, wait, how long ago was that? And I've literally had people say it was a month ago. It was two months ago. I'm like, oh no. Like, oh no, you need to continue. Yeah. So I wrote them and I just, I actually got a copywriter. And what I do is I send her like this, you know, blurb of information and then she makes it look really pretty and puts it all together. So we did that. And then now my studio manager will write blogs. And so I shoot so much and almost all of my clients let me share their images. I would say maybe nine out of 10. And so after every session, I send out a post session questionnaire and nine out of 10 times they fill that out too. And we turn that into a blog. And so a lot of my email marketing is actually relationship building. And so it's a lot of like before and afters and here's Miss A's story. And then in between there is thrown in like informational things like what types of lingerie to wear if you're built like this or what types of lingerie are the best to wear for your boudoir shoot, the five makeup types that that look best whenever you're doing a boudoir shoot or this is what will happen or how to take off your false eyelashes, things like that that people want to know and they might be scared to ask or they might not even know that they need to ask or that they need to know it. Uh, so things like that are really helpful. And when I'm providing them, you're more likely to have people open emails when you're providing them with information that they want to know. Instead of just, this is the biggest mistake I see photographers make with email automation is they'll like just send out email after email with sales and promotions. And so the only time you're hearing from people is whenever they're running a sale, which is once a month. So there's no sense of urgency there for your client base because all you're doing is throwing sales at them. Like there's no, but there's no relationship building, right? So it's just- yeah a bunch of sales that no one buys. Yeah, and by the way, a pro tip, because obviously you guys know, if you guys are on our email list that me and Jen have tons of emails and tons of value that we put in there, uh, one thing you can do, like if you absolutely hate, hate, hate writing, like me and Jen kind of, yes. uh, is doing Facebook Lives and then you can either go back and write your points out from what you've said, or you can even, I think Google, I actually, um, like the new Google thing, I, there's in like a, an app or an accessibility thing where no kidding, we were writing a blog and I literally just put my phone and it transcribed the whole thing. We just went back and like fixed some of the words and like, oh, there's an entire blog and an entire page uh, That's so smart. for us. So, and I know me and you do that a lot. Like we'll do lives and then we'll give them to a writer and then they'll just write amazing yeah. blog from it. So, Yours are always better though because you can stay on topic and I ramble. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, okay. So you, you like, you got all these emails and by the way, like, you know, people, sometimes it's hard. Like if someone's at zero emails, it feels like, it feels kind of like, you know, the feeling you have, like when you're starting Instagram and you have zero followers, you start a new business, you're right. like, Oh, I'm at right. zero. You get excited. You make your profile. You right. set, you're like, post your nine images and you're like, Oh man, I got 20. Like, like how do you like get past that barrier? Like, you know, and keep going if you have zero right now. Yeah. So here's the thing, like you just have to do it. I think so many people get hung up with the inaction or like the fear of action and you just have to rip the bandaid off. You just have to do it. And everyone starts somewhere, right? And, you know, today might be the day where you're starting or where you're deciding to start and you just have to do it. The you just have to take that step and just start because if you never start, then you're never going to get anything done. And if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. And no one wants to stay there. Right. Even though last year we grossed half a million dollars this year, my goal was to grow 600 right from the studio. And it's always good to keep moving and keep having goals, but you just have to start. You just have to do it. Yeah. And the, the funny thing is, is, you know, I, we do done for you and we have a lot of students that start with, and a lot of them start with zero. Like yeah. the biggest thing is like, if they want to jumpstart, I, I agree. Bridal shows definitely help. Um, we do a lot of like opt-ins. So like we'll create, yeah. like, you said like a guide. We have a photographer that made like a, like a lingerie guide and it sells like, it doesn't sell, but people opt in like, yeah. like they'll, everyone that joins the website, like, Right. Five to 10% of people download it from the pop-up. 
And then even from ads, we'll run traffic to that stuff. And honestly, I've heard people tell us like, those are the best leads, right? Yeah. Like, even 10, you know, 10 emails, 20 emails, 30 emails is better than zero because those Absolutely. people have people to talk to, those people are joining their group, those people are leaving their phone numbers and you know, you don't need volume. I think you spoke to, you did an interview with Lydia, like she yeah. did a splash sale and I think she booked like 30 women and she only had like 400 people in our group. Right. And everyone's like obsessed. Like, how do I get 10,000? And it's like, you don't. Yeah, people get tattoos. Like they all got tattoos. <laughs> Yeah, her clients got, they, yeah. didn't they get matching tattoos? They got matching tattoos. I was like, that is like next level shit. That's not, that's wild. Yeah. And by the way, speaking of which, not only do you have a massive email list, you have a massive Facebook group. And I always tell people like, they're not, they're almost the same thing, right? Like they're platforms that are like your communities that you get to deliver your message. Like, how did you build your Facebook group? Like, how did you go from email list building at Bridal Show to building a Facebook group? So a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work and a lot of engagement and a lot of, I, I don't know if coddling is the right word, but I take care of the group. I put a lot of effort into it. Um, especially in the beginning, I did a lot of lives. I did a lot of relationship building. And I know like the thought of doing a live in a group is kind of intimidating. I totally get it. Um, but again, you just have to do it. And what you can do is actually ask your group what questions they have. What do you want us to talk about, right? And then you'll see, like they'll write a million things and then you choose what you wanna talk about and you pick one or two and say someone writes, what do I wear to my shoot? I actually did a whole lingerie class in my, in my VIP group one night. I picked out about like 20 pieces of lingerie, some of it was mine, some of it was from the studio and I just picked the pieces up and I talked about it, like this is a bodysuit, this is, I love shooting these, they shoot really well. This is a baby doll negligee. Please don't ever bring these because I won't ever shoot it. Like I went through pieces of lingerie. It was like 45 minute class. And it was probably one of my most popular lives that I did. And people still watch it. And because my group is so big now, you probably know this better than I do. There's like features that roll out. And one of the features in my VIP group is topics. And so all of like my classes I have listed as a topic and in my VIP group, um, all the testimonials, there's like hundreds in there. I list those as a topic so people can go in quickly. And if they're new to my group, they can go right to the, click on the topic testimonials and they'll see like 120 or hundred, however many I have on there testimonials. Um, so that's really helpful. Yeah, that's really cool. So, you know, seven years ago, zero Facebook groups, zero email list. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, maybe for people that don't exactly know, like it's been growing steadily, right? Because you used to shoot everything, right? So let's talk yeah. about that. Like everything. You used to shoot everything. Like, Products, you shoot? newborns, all of it. Dogs, everything. <laughs> How did everything. you transition from dogs to dogs? <laughs> I mean, I wasn't the best dog photographer. Like, to be honest, I really wasn't that great at it. But um yeah, I shot everything because, and I remember, I remember very specifically, I would hear other, you know, t educators talk and they would be like, you need to find a niche. You need to find what you're good at. You need to focus in. And I'd be like, no, I can book so much more whenever I shoot products and headshots and models and families and newborns and maternity and seniors and corporate headshots, everything. I literally shot everything except for weddings because weddings give me an anxiety attack. But everything. And then what I found is when I started leaning into my niche, into one genre, it just, it grew massively. And now in my state, in the tri-state area, I live in Delaware, people know me like everywhere. Like I'll, you know, we'll go into a restaurant and like, there'll be like a person staring at me and like smile and wave. And I'll be like, Hey, <laughs> but like, and then they'll come up to me and be like, Oh my God, you're dead. Like they know you whenever you find your niche and you stick to it, people will recognize you. And then you're building that brand recognition and you're building the trust and the loyalty. And so now like if someone asks about a boudoir shoot in a Facebook group, my name will come up 50 times, almost everyone. Because if I haven't shot that person, I've shot three or four people that they know, you know, and that's huge. Yeah, that makes sense. And the other thing is like, 
it's really hard because I, I, I do work with people that shoot multiple genres and some of them are extremely talented and they're like, you know, in a lot of genres. Number one, it's very hard to find people that are like extremely talented in, in all these different genres, right? Yeah. Like, Absolutely. Imagine trying to be like the best newborn photographer and the best maternity and yeah. the best headshot and the best yeah. wedding engagement portrait. Yeah. Like it's hard. Yeah. Second part is, is like, then they have to start building out like email automations for almost every single one. So it's like, yeah. you know, the level of education, imagine like you're a jack of all trades, but then the boudoir photographer, like imagine they're competing with you. You have an email automation for a year just on this with like yeah. hundreds of testimonials. Yeah. And they might have like two because like their attention is just so spread thin. So like, yeah. how did you even, how did you even start waning, 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 waning off of um, the different genres and like, how did you end up on boudoir? Yeah. So as I, as I guess that you can think about like a scale as the scale started tipping with more boudoir, then it started tipping the other way. And I started tapering off the other genres and Newborn was the last genre that I tapered off of. And towards the end, I actually hired an associate photographer to take those newborn shoots because number one, I didn't want to shoot them. And number two, I wasn't as good at it as she was because she shoots it all the time. And, and then I hired her to shoot Lincoln's newborn pictures because I didn't even want anything to do with shooting my own kid. Um, and I recognized that I wasn't as good at it as she was. And um, that was a pretty pivotal point for me where I was like, okay, when I focused and I leaned in on my boudoir photography and now because I did that, I know I can do a good job no matter who walks through the door. I very rarely will get anxious anymore about anything when someone, cause I know I'm prepared. I have all the tools in my head. I have all the poses I need to do. I know I can shoot someone no matter what their body type is. And, and that's important. And, you know, versus with a newborn, for instance, that was the other genre that I shot a lot of, you know, if you have a crying baby, it, I was like, all right, well, we'll reschedule. I, that was kind of the point where I was. I didn't even really want to try anymore. I was just like, we're good. Or, hey, I'll give you back your money. Because <laughs> yeah. you just kind of get to the point where you don't want to, you know, try anymore. And that's kind of where I was. And now with Boudoir, I just feel, I feel like I am an expert at what I do. And because I have that confidence, it makes my clients trust me more. Okay. So by the way, I do want to jump back to this because this is probably why most people logged on, right? They were like, holy smokes, like how does this chart work? So walk us through this. Like you, this is basically, I know it says the 31st, but it's only the 23rd. Yeah. So yeah. how many clients did this take? Like, you know, um, you know, where are these people being booked from? How are they finding you? Like, oh, geez. and how does, how do you sustain this? Right? Because for a lot of people, they would just get so bogged down. I know for, for me, like even thinking about it, I'd yeah. probably get so bogged down by just this month that like every month after would go back down to like regular world, 5,000, 6. Yeah. How do you like keep it? Cause I know some your past months are like basically mirroring this almost. Yeah. Yeah. So I should have pulled all of like how many shoots I did. I, I feel like this month I've done three, six, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. 14, 15, 16. So, uh, this month so far, I've done 15 shoots and I've had eight ordering appointments and I have five more ordering appointments to go. So I actually know that I, my year end I'm trending by the end of this month, my month and revenue should be probably over 60. It's going to be my highest month of the year. And how I maintain this is through systems and automations. Everything is systematic. I'm very systematic in my workflow and my shooting. I have timelines. Everything is nailed down. And if I didn't have those systems, there's no way I can maintain this because it's a lot of work. If I was having to write emails every single time, think about like the extra time that would take me. But instead, you know, they leave their shoot. I set the automation for their ordering appointment. And then that goes, it's like, it, it just does it by itself. And so when they come back, they're ready. And then most, I do do payment plans, but a lot of them pay in full. And if they pay in full, I, they leave, I place their wallet order. If they've, if they've made one 
If not, I do their album proof, I send it out, and I give them their digital files when they leave, if they've paid in full. And so then all that's left is I have to order the album and they approve the proof. So it's very systematic, it's very simple, um, and it works really well. And I keep to my system and I keep to my timeline, that way I don't drop the ball on anything. So one of the biggest things I'm gonna ask, because this number is incredible, like Thanks. how do the expenses stay low? Yeah. Like, how do they stay low, you know, and how do they just not creep up, right? Because most of the time when like businesses start making more money, like they start spending even more, right? Like I've yeah. heard people making 15,000 and then just going and spending 25 and then they're in the um, That's a great question. So I have three major expenses, right? The red is client orders. The blue is retouching and then the green is hair and makeup artist. Those are my three main expenses and I don't really buy anything else like and my subscriptions come out yearly so those expenses are like in on a different month so some months it might be a little higher right like I use Animoto I use sticky albums but still that's only what like three hundred dollars I don't know so a lot of my subscriptions come out in one time at one time so I mean I'm sure it would be a slightly higher if I did it monthly but I think it's easier to keep track of it like that and then really, I don't have a lot of expenses. Like I don't go and buy crazy props. Like I'm very simple with, I sh with what I shoot. Like you're in the room right now where I shoot most of my sessions. And those two plants I got from Amazon, like a year ago, that white rug I got from Home Goods, like five years ago, I got this tapestry, tapestry from Amazon. And oops, I shot my phone. I got that tapestry from Amazon and I have two of them hanging. They were like $16 a piece and my clients love it. It's like their favorite prop. And then that chandelier I got from Amazon like a year ago, it was $80. I'm very simple. Like I keep it simple. There's no reason to continue to spend money, which is the other reason when I got out of newborn photography, I was spending so much money on newborn props, like newborn hats and headbands and rompers and shorts. I mean, it, the list is never ending. And newborn photographers, you always feel like you need to have another prop, another set, another look, right? Because you don't want to repeat the same thing with other newborns, right? So you're always buying. And those things are expensive. Like one newborn set is probably like $150. You know, I was doing that all the damn time. So just taking that expense out is huge. But my three core expenses monthly are retouching, client orders, and hair and makeup. Those, you know, every month it's the same with those. Okay, so we've done an overview of like, you know, where you started, how you got here, and like basically like your ethos and like strategy. Um, yeah. And then obviously that culminates in your monthly earnings and what the expenses yeah. look like. So for someone who's like watching this and they're like, oh, I, like, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know how this like works. Can you just like walk us through like, what does it look like for, imagine your ideal client is out there and they're about to find you somehow, whether it's like, what is their journey like through your process? Like, what does it look like before they know you all the way till like they're picking up their packs? You just describe that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So is this like with someone that's, that's booked me or someone that hasn't booked me? I want to say with someone that has that, let's just say they like, they have no idea who you are right now. Like they okay. don't know you exist and they're going to find out about you today. Like what would that journey look like? Like okay. talk about like the touch points, you know, emails, yeah. anything, your mm -hmm. phone calls, like. Okay. So say they find me somehow, Larry, they're in my VIP group or, you know, they find me through Google or someone recommends me on Facebook. My first goal is to get them into an email automation for my cold leads, which like we were talking about, it spreads over the span of a year at this point. And then in those emails, my next job is to get them into another way of contacting them with my text messaging, with my VIP group, with Instagram. I'm always trying to get them in as many ways as possible to follow me. Because remember, you can't put all of your marketing eggs in one basket, right? Like Facebook, you can't guarantee that people will see stuff you put on Facebook. You can't guarantee people will see stuff on Instagram. So you have to try and reach them in as many ways as possible. So they'll follow me through my you know, email automation. And then let's say they decide they want to book. 
So they send me out an email and then Nikki, my studio manager, will respond back and set up a phone consult. And she, her booking rate is pretty good. I mean, she books probably about five out of 10 and which half is really darn good for booking. Um, and then when they're on the phone with Nikki, she takes their retainer fee and then starts them in Dubsado, which is my CRM, my client relationship management software. And she will start them into an automation for, for booked clients. And so after she books them, she also schedules my hair and makeup artist and starts their automation. And then she writes me and lets me know that they're booked. And then I also write them on a paper calendar that I have because I really like paper calendars and I like highlighters. And so I highlight them different colors so that I know quickly what I'm doing. Um, so then they follow through my email automation until their shoot. And two months before their shoot, Nikki calls them and confirms their date to see if they have any questions. A month before their shoot, they get another email saying, hey, in one month, you have a shoot coming up, right back, yes, if you're ready to be a bombshell or whatever that email says. And then um, it continues on, they continue getting emails, much like that. And then the day before their shoot, there's another email that goes out saying, confirm your shoot, it's tomorrow. And if they don't respond quickly enough, Nikki will text them and call them. And then Nikki will actually confirm with my hair and makeup artist and myself that the shoot is confirmed. So she's on them. And I actually just started implementing that a few months ago because I wanted, um, I needed to turn over something else to her and that was something I was doing. So I gave her that responsibility. So she follows up and she also confirms my ordering appointments as well. And so we do the shoot and then right after they leave, I start them, I start them in another automation for their ordering appointment, preparing them for their ordering appointment. And the first email they get has my full investment menu. And then there's like seven or eight other emails that follow. Then they come for their ordering appointment, they make their purchasing decisions, and if they decide to do a payment plan, I will figure out their payment, we'll figure out the terms of their payment plan when they're there. I create all the invoices in Square automatic invoicing so that they're ready to go. I write down the amounts that they're paying and the dates, so every calendar, so say their next payment is 1115, I'll write their last name, Smith, and then $500 and circle it in my paper calendar as well, so I know that that money's coming in. And then on that day of their last payment, I'll write deliver in my paper calendar, just as a reminder that I need to get their order out as quickly as possible. And I always deliver on the day that their payment plan ends. They've been waiting for six months, I don't want them to wait a second more, right? And then I place their order once they approve the album proof and albums are sent to me and then I send them to the client and wall art, I drop ship directly to the client. And then if they've given me permission to show their images, then I also send them out an email the next day asking them for a before and after or a before picture, just a no makeup selfie. And most of my clients do that as well. And then they also get that post-session questionnaire that we turn into blogs. That sounds pretty streamlined. And, yeah. <laughs> and that's basically the exact same for everyone, right? Same. It's the same. It doesn't change. Yeah. I say the same things. I do the same things. Nikki does the same things. Yeah. I remember a couple, maybe like a year ago exactly. Uh, I remember because it was like my New Year's resolution to go back to the gym and I was listening to a podcast. And the guy on the podcast, he says... He's, the guy had a heart attack yeah. and he talked about how like he never saw his kids. He never had time with them. And he basically sold his business and like wanted to get out of it. And he said, one of the biggest problems was, was even though, you know, his business was like, did have processes, he like, they were doing a lot of custom work. And his quote was bespoke equals, but broke. Right. So if you do bespoke work, which is like the English word for like, you know, ultra custom or like tailored yeah. or something. Like you're going to be broke. And he said, you know, the thing you need to really focus on is just creating widgets, right? So like create an assembly line and you kind of describe that, right? Like they get yeah. an email list, they join your group, they get greeted, they have a phone consult, they get put into this process, they get the shoot, they get into the net yeah. process, and they order, and then you guys have your behind the scenes processes. Yeah. So you're not going to have a heart attack, hopefully. Yeah. No. I very rarely get stressed out, like ever. And you're not slowed down month to month because 
every mm-hmm. single time I see people like scaling, people that don't have processes, it really quickly starts breaking down because they start getting mm-hmm. overwhelmed. Things start falling apart. This yeah. didn't get edited. This got ordered wrong. Their order didn't come in. Like two albums from the same client because they didn't even realize the same client. You know. I actually missed a whole part of the process when you started talking about that, but because I also send it out to my retoucher. So as soon as they're done with their shoot, I start that email automation and then I send out the images. I call them, send them out to my retoucher and then they come back about two days before the ordering appointment and then I do that work. So anyway, there was a little part there that I forgot when you said that, it reminded me. By the way, I did want to clarify because I saw on that chart, uh, I know people might be curious on like how much you spend on advertising and I'm kind of familiar because we do your ads. Yeah. On I think on a regular month, you were doing about maybe close to a thousand dollars in advertising. Um, you're so busy now that you were like, uh, I don't really need that. So it might be like 300 or 450, somewhere in there. Um, but it is super, super low, depending on like how many clicks the Google ads get. Yeah. But it is super low. Um, and even in my experience, because I know, again, I want to break through people's stories because they're, they're probably just like, oh, you know, not I'm not saying everyone, but some people are just like, well, Jen probably spends so much on advertising. So that's the only reason. They don't see how much work goes into it. But people even spending two, three, four hundred, even a little bit, they're seeing results. And the best part is, is like, I always tell people like, you only need to come up with like the first couple hundred, right? Even maybe the first hundred, depending on how good you are on the phone and how good your sales process is. Because yeah. if you put it in and then you get a booking from that, then that just paid for your advertising plus more. Right, right. right. And as you go, you're playing with house money. So yeah. That's and, right. And yeah, yeah how, do you, how do you see that? Like for yourself, like is advertising like a must? Like I know you do a lot of organic in that pace. Yeah. Like, where do you see like the paid portion coming in? So it was, it was very important when we ran our session giveaway in August, I feel like that really helped grow the group. And so my group grew by how many did it grow by in August? I think now it's probably like 3000. Yeah. So, I mean, that, so yeah, I mean, there was definitely an ad spend that was by far the highest ad spend I've ever done, but it's paid off. I booked like what 90 sessions and we had 3000 people join the group and my email list grew by like 4,500 maybe. Yeah, it it was a lot. And and a lot of people just saw the ads and got like impressions, right. And it reminded older people about it. Yeah. And all those people traveled to my website. And so now we have their information in case we want to ever retarget them. Right. So the, we, there was a really large ad spend that month, but it was so worth it. Like you have to spend money to make money. So, you know, I feel like in the past when I've done this session giveaway and booked a lot of sessions, it was very successful. I still was booking like 30 to 40, but with that extra steroid push of the Facebook ads, it basically doubled what I'd been doing. And it also circumvented, you know, Facebook does not like grow your group contests, right? Like you can get your shit shut down for that. So the best way to circumvent that is to have people requesting to join your group instead of people adding people into the group, right? So by doing Facebook ads, you're reaching people that you wouldn't normally be able to reach. And all of those ads, the, those, those three or 4,000 people that joined the group, those are all people that requested to join. They weren't people adding other people into the group. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. So actually I had a, man, I can't believe it just slipped my mind. Cause you, uh, it was on the topic of the group itself. Um, yeah. anyways, so all these people join the group, um, and you already have your process where like you guys are posting, you're going live, like you're sharing content. Like if somebody was starting from zero, like mm-hmm. I know now things have changed with a little bit of group growth. Like how would you suggest they start? Start because I know I was talking to maybe Kim. Kim actually just joined the mastermind, and she was telling me that she told she's in like week one, and she said that all she did was basically like start emailing people out and like posting on social media. She has like three hundred eighty five group members, and she's already has a bunch of consults from that. So like, how, where do people start? Like if they're at zero and no emails, like. Yeah. I think that a great place to start is your personal profile. Like, you know, start. And also Facebook is a huge community. So you want to like target communities that, you know, potentially could have your target client. Right. So in Delaware, there's like a really, there's, there's a city, like a town that has a very 
high SES, like people, the houses are more expensive. People make more money that live there. And there's a mom's group there. And every Saturday they do like a small business Saturday. So I make sure that every Saturday myself or my studio manager will go in and post, you know, something about my VIP group. And that's a great place to start is doing some investigative work on like what areas in your community could potentially be filled with your ideal client and then start infiltrating those groups and joining them and becoming a presence there. And, you know, people need to see something quite a few times before they take action. So, you know, you just start posting every small business Saturday, you, you start being aware, you know, whenever people ask for a boudoir photographer and you just, you just start, you just have to start, you know? Yeah. By the way, I, I remember what it was on the giveaway. Yeah. Uh, so someone, so I was talking to someone and they were always so just against giving away sessions. Right. Yeah. And, and I get it. A lot of people, uh, a lot of times people are like, no, if I give away the session, then no one will buy or book until they find out who the winner is. Or yeah. they just, the number one, the argument to that is everyone we've done this giveaway model for people have booked before the giveaway has ended in yeah. dozens and dozens and dozens. Um, some people 50, some people 30, some people 25, some people close to a hundred. Yeah. And the other thing is, is if you don't do the session, it, it leaves you open to getting people that'll join the giveaway that have no interest in that topic. Does that make sense? So like, especially, and I've realized this cause you know, we, I work with a lot of like photographers is if we would do a giveaway where we gave away like a laptop then we would just get random realtors being like, exactly. yeah, I want a laptop too. Right. And it's people right. that would never want where like something more powerful would be like a camera lens that works for a specific camera right. or right. a subscription to like an editing software. And right. that makes it like, you're not really going to join or like take up our email space. Like if you're not interested in that. And I think like boudoir is something that's even, it's even more specific where like right. you really have to like kind of want to do it or have the personality. Cause there's some people that like, they are super like, I'm not going to say like religious or they're just super like a hundred percent and they're just like, we'll never no convincing. Yeah. 5,000 emails won't convince me. Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it is, I mean, yeah, I'm going to be doing a shoot for free, but I also booked 90 sessions. So I'll gladly do, you know, a few hours of free work and take a hit. Like I think, you know, I'll spend about 250 on retouching and then the album itself will be about 250. So it'll be about like a $500 spend. But I mean, I booked 90 sessions and my average sale is $4,000. So fast math, right? That's. Yeah. And that's those people that book within like the first couple days. Like that doesn't even include like. What's going to happen. Yeah. And that are, have joined and now know about everything. Yeah, absolutely. It was totally worth it. And Um, I only do one a year, like I'll only do that one and then I'll do it again next August. And the other benefit to doing the, the session giveaway in August is I have all this new blood in my group and black Friday is coming up. And now I have a bunch of new people that are getting to know me and have a few solid months to get to know me before I potentially run another flash sale. And I grab those people as well and book out the rest of 2020. Yeah, that's awesome. So we talked about a lot and there's definitely a lot of actionable stuff people can go do. Uh, and the funny thing is, is like, I, I know for a lot of people, cause it's, it's the same with me. Like sometimes I know what to do and I even know how to go find out how to do it. But like, if I don't have certainty, I just won't do it. I'm like frozen. I'm like, Oh, I just got to keep thinking about it. Um, so before we get off, like, is there any resource that like has helped you any book, any podcast, anything, that has helped you like just take more action or that you would recommend to anybody else? That's a good question. So I'm, we always talk about this. You always listen to like podcasts and like things like that. And I am such a doer and not so much a thinker. That sounds really bad. Like, but if I think that something will work, I'll just go do it and I'll just jump. And sometimes I don't necessarily think as much as I should about it. But for the most part, it's been really helpful. Um, But I love uh, Jordan Belfort, The Way of the Wolf. It's, I love him. Um, That's one of my favorite books. And then of course, Simon Sinek is great. I love him too. But I honestly, 
don't do as much reading and listening as I should because I'm working so hard. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I actually think um, that's a good point because I think sometimes we do too much listening and reading and YouTubing and podcasting and et cetera. And I always say, and I've heard other people put this eloquently and they say that basically starts turning into a substitute for action. Right. Mm, and and that could sense. be anything, right? Like that could be a Facebook group, right? It's like, yeah. instead of me going and doing all this stuff about email marketing that I just heard, you know, in the past, I might've been like, well, I got to go ask 60 people in a Facebook group to make sure that I'm doing the right thing because yes. if you don't say it, then it gives me an excuse not to do it. Yeah. So Absolutely. I agree. Like doing it is probably the best teacher. And I found also like, there's such a group thing sometimes where like, if you're asking in a Facebook group, 500 people that don't do it well either, then you're going to get bad advice. Like it's better to just go do it and see what happens and work hard. And rather than like sit there and be like, Oh, what do the masses think? What does everyone else think about this? Like, what should I do here? No, just go do it. And if it doesn't work, figure it out. And, or if you can't figure it out, then find the tools to help you and then actually implement them. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest things is like, you know, the masses tend to be very average as a whole, right? I'm not saying anyone listening to this is average, but I'm saying like, obviously we have like a median, right? And like right. median income in photography is very, very low. Yeah. I remember, and it's kind of like real estate, like it, ha it ends up happening like in places where like creativity or your work controls your outcome, like mm -hmm. all the resources yeah. and outcome pull up at the top and then everybody else is left like thinking like the system doesn't work, right? That's why like, People say realtor, they don't, sometimes they don't even think of them as real professions. You're like, oh, is that your hobby? Oh, you're a photographer? Yeah. Like, is that your hobby? You right. know, and they don't really realize. So if you go and ask the masses, you're going to get the masses answer where you're just, you're going to get beat down and you're going to get discouraged. You're going to be like, well, didn't work for everyone else. And it's like, you're right. Cause they didn't execute it. They probably didn't, they probably never executed it and they didn't execute yeah. it well, even if they tried. Yeah. Or they weren't open to change. They weren't open to learning. Cause I, you know, I've talked with a lot of photographers recently too. Like I'll look at their work and I'll be like, Hmm, dude, like you need to like make some changes. I'd be like, no, no, my work is great. Like I, you know, it's great. And I'd be like, yeah, but how much money are you making? Like, are you getting paid for it? And you know, that's the thing. You just have to be open to change. Um, but yeah, and it's funny you said that because people will ask me, like, I'll meet someone, like, random. Like, we were just in Utah and visiting my dad. And, you know, you talk to people and I'd be, they were like, oh, yeah, what do you do? I'm like, I'm a photographer. And they're like, oh, yeah, so what else do you do? Like, what's your job? And I'm like, no, that is my job. I'm like a legit photographer. Like, I, I get paid to do this. I'm like, oh, really? Because they're so used to, like, people, you know, doing it as a hobby or, like, working another job or you know, that's, like, just their extra money but like it's rare that you find people that are doing this full time and what I love is our mastermind which is more and more students are just leaving their full-time job and doing and doing photography full-time so it's so cool to see I love it yeah yeah and it's funny because when I left the Marine Corps uh, I did 10 years and I remember so like five years in I went and I went to special operations and my mom you know she's like uh, you know uh, I, I don't know how to describe it, but she's like traditional Hispanic where she's like, you know, son, when are you going to get a real job? And I'm like, mom, I'm doing a job that like only 400 people in the world have. Like I'm, I'm doing pretty well. And my stepdad was like, yeah, he's doing really well. Don't worry. And then when I got out of the military, she's like, okay, now you're going to become an engineer. You're going to become a lawyer, like your cousins. Like, will you please, you know, make me proud. Okay. <laughs> and I was like, no mom, I'm going to be a photographer. And I, think she was going to faint because she was like <laughs> on the side like what do you mean like you have bigger things to do and it's it's just so funny that yeah you're right like the industry a lot of people look at it and you know sometimes we don't do ourselves the biggest service and it's a good thing that you know hopefully we, I believe we have a really good resource for people that are like you know breaking that mold and they're making other people realize like hey this can absolutely be you know a way to make a living a way to add value back to your community and you know actually make something amazing yeah, changed our lives. I mean, we've changed, <clears throat> it has changed our lives. It's my husband and my life, like our children's lives. It's, it's absolutely amazing. We're able to do things now that five years ago, I would have never even dreamt, not in my wildest dreams. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. 
anyways, thank you so much for being on with me, Jen. I really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll be doing a few more of these and hopefully we'll have a third person in here that we'll be interviewing. Yeah. I look forward to that as well. Sounds good. Thank you so much. I hope that this was really helpful. We covered a lot today, so. All right. Bye. Okay, bye.